Sound is a longitudinal wave. Since compression waves utilize the medium to propagate energy, the speed depends on the medium. And then I've taken this sample from a chart in your book on page 348. These are just a few of the speeds listed on that chart. Speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second. That's at standard STP, which is 25 degrees Celsius. Room temperature, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. If we freeze the air, cool it down to zero degrees, which makes it more dense, the speed goes down to 331 meters per second. This is contrary to what they said in chapel the other day. The speed of sound goes down when the density goes up. It is very awkward because it's something that you have wrong in your head that we will address multiple times until you get water. it right. I said wa water. water. Speed of sound through water is 1,440 meters per second. It's nearly three times. It's nearly three times the speed of sound in, in air, yet water is much more dense than air. So based on what I just said, you would expect it to go slower through water, but in fact it goes considerably faster. Why? Why is actually because it's much more complicated than just density. Energy is transmitted elastically. We've already talked about this when we think about waves in general. And we've also talked about it when we looked at springs oscillating. The restoration energy that causes something to rebound after being deformed is essentially spring constant. And the spring constant, the restoration energy capabilities of a medium, depends on the characteristics of the medium. Much more than just density. Much more. It has to do with the crystal structure and the actual bonds within the matter and a variety of other things that we will not even get to. But the idea, the most reasonable way to think about it is to think about it as conductivity, right? Electricity is energy, and energy is more easily transmitted as electricity through water than it is through air because the water is a better conductor. Not because the water is more dense, but because the electrochemical characteristics of the water are different than air. And so I'm alluding to a complexity that is very, very, very dense that we are not going to explore completely. But it's very important to take away that the density is only one of many factors that change how energy is transmitted through a medium. And we'll look further into some of these a little bit later, but for now it's a nice introduction. And it's easy to recognize when you start talking about metals. Aluminum, gold, steel, all of these things are excellent electric conductors. They are also excellent sound conductors. This is because in both cases, energy is what's being transmitted through the medium. The best way to think about it is uh, uh, train tracks, right? You go down to the train track, you look out at the, down the track, you see nothing. Put your ear to the sky, you hear nothing. Put your ear on the track and you can hear the train coming. This is because the sound transmits faster, farther, and better through the steel tracks than it does through the air itself. Right. So beyond that, characteristics of sound are twofold, loudness and pitch. Loudness and pitch relate to physical quantities that we've already addressed. Pitch is frequency. Frequency, right, measured in hertz, is the inverse of period and has to do with how quickly the individual vibrations of the air are occurring. The human audible range, which is the, the pitch or the frequency that you can hear, ranges from about 20 to 20,000 hertz. Now, this is an ideal range for most humans. Some humans can hear outside of this range. Some cannot. And this range degrades as you age. If you've ever taken a hearing test, which I assume all of you have, they do two different things. They vary the loudness of the pitch, right? So it goes beep, and then it goes beep, and it goes beep, and it goes beep, and you try and identify it. But it also does it in terms of pitch. So you get a very low vibration, and then you get a very high 
buzzing noise. That range is measuring how well you can hear the audible range. And the audible range is a relatively low pitch of 20 hertz, which is very, very low bass, all the way up to 20,000 hertz, which is a very, very high. Um, think of if you've ever plucked the strings on the neck of a guitar after the bridge at the top, right? You just pluck them. It's very, very kinky, kinky. It just sounds kind of like um, hitting your fork against the metal surface or something like that, right? That range degrades as we get older because that which measures your hearing in your head is your bones inside your ears. There are three bones, right, inside your ears that vibrate in order to resonate the sound so that your brain can transmit it into electrical signals. The older you get, the more degraded your bones, including those three microscopic bones, degrade. And so eventually it gets to a point where you don't hear 20 to 20,000 hertz. You hear closer to like 50 to 10,000 hertz. It closes the range. The best example that you should be familiar with as teenagers is the mosquito ring. Mosquito ring on your cell phone is a cell phone ring that I can't hear when your phone rings, but you can because I have heard a lot of really loud music in my life and my ears cannot pick up 20,000 hertz worth of pitch, right? Beyond this range, sound is possible for all kinds of frequencies, all ranging from one hertz all the way to hundreds of thousands of hertz. And so there is obviously sound that exists that we cannot hear. Above 20,000 hertz is called ultrasonic. Ultrasonic is things like dogs. Dogs can hear from 20 hertz all the way up to 50,000 hertz, which is many, many times higher than our highest range which is why a dog whistle is something that exists, right? Dogs can hear you talking, but they can also hear sounds beyond that, right? Which is why sometimes if you're in a room, like for example, where the TV is off, but emitting a high frequency sound, sometimes that will really annoy teenagers because you can actually hear that sound. Sometimes that will really annoy my cat, even though I have no idea why she's upset. And it's because there is a high frequency sound coming from something that I can't pick up. Beyond that are bats. Bats are not blind, but they also cannot see in the dark. They have eyes, but they are not night vision enabled. And so when they hunt at night, they emit a high frequency sound as high as 100,000 hertz, five times higher than our highest frequency, well beyond that which dogs can hear. They use that as echolocation. They literally chirp and make a sound that you can't hear that goes out echoes off of things and then they hear it. They use that to locate where the mosquito is in the air. It's called sonar, right? We use it in submarines at a much lower frequency in order to echolocate and navigate underwater. Bats use it to hunt very, very small objects in the air at night, right? It's remarkable. The low end of the frequency is not called subsonic. It is called infrasonic. This goes back to your understanding of waves. We already know ultraviolet and infrared. Ultraviolet and infrared are the color ranges of visible light outside of our visible human spectrum. Right? So when it comes to light, these things are relatable. Infrasonic sounds are sounds that exist below 20 hertz. These are sounds that we feel instead of hear. Right? Because the frequency is so low, it is not enough to resonate the bones inside your ears, but it is enough to knock your chest backwards. So if you were to stand in front of a large subwoofer, you don't actually hear the sound coming out, you feel it. The example is an earthquake. An earthquake is a resonant frequency that is often well below 20 hertz. They exist at 3, 5, 10 hertz. That is the vibration with which the ground is actually vibrating. You don't hear an earthquake, you hear the stuff falling off the walls. But you can feel an earthquake occurring because of the vibration. It's low enough that we actually can register the fact that the ground is vibrating. Isn't that like far enough away on a different planet that you can't hear an earthquake? No. That's a good question because the frequency wouldn't change as it propagates away. Remember, the loudness, the intensity, is what decreases as it goes away, but not the pitch. The pitch remains constant. That's an excellent question. So we've, so that's pitch. We've already talked about loudness in the sense that we've talked about intensity. Loudness 
is a proxy for intensity. In other words, just like we say pitch when we're talking about sound, we're really talking about frequency. When we say loudness, we're really talking about intensity. The amount of energy that a sound carries is how loud that sound is, right? And it has to do with how high that vibrational peak is or the amplitude of the sine wave that's generating the sound. The more energy there is, the larger the peak is, the more impactful that sound can be. Problem is, is of course, we know that intensity, right, is a, a quadratic relationship based on distance. It's inversely proportional to the radius squared. We've already talked about this. So intensity has an odd range when it comes to human beings because it's factors that relate to that proportionality. So in intensity, right, which I is power over area, which we've already written down once or twice, the human audible range for intensity is from 10 to the negative 12th watts per meter squared to 1 watts per meter squared. That scale is very hard to visualize, right? It's very hard to understand and interpret how loud something is. Because if I told you that normal conversation was point zero 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 two watts per meter squared, you would go, what? And it's very hard to understand what that means in terms of energy and in terms of loudness itself. So if intensity in watts per meter squared is the SI measurement of sound, decibels, which is a much more familiar scale, is a non-SI scale that is generated literally to make it more interpretable. Right? This is called intensity level or sound level. Intensity level is measured um, or is given the symbol capital beta and is measured in decibels, lowercase d, capital B, decibels. Intensity level is simply a conversion formula to make intensity a more understandable number. This is because loudness and intensity are not directly proportional because of that spread through that spherical zone as the wave propagates outward. For a sound to be two times as loud, registered by us, the intensity has to be a hundred times, no, excuse me, a ten times as intense. So for every two times that we interpret loudness, the actual energy has increased tenfold, right? So that's a dramatic increase that doesn't register when we just look at bare numbers of intensity from 0 0.00001 to 0 0.0001. That's a 10 time increase, which means the sound is twice as loud. It's very hard to interpret that. So instead, this formula is given as a way to reorganize intensity into a more relatable form. And it's very useful if we understand from math, powers of 10 is a log, right? A logarithm is based on powers of 10. So this is simply a, a power of 10 conversion. Beta can be calculated by multiplying 10 times the log of the quantity I, which is the intensity, divided by I naught, which is a special intensity. This formula is how we convert intensity into decibels where I naught is the low end of the human audible range when it comes to intensity, called the threshold of hearing. It is the lowest possible loudness that a human can hear, which is 10 to the negative 12 watts per meter squared. So I naught, called the threshold of hearing, is 10 to the negative 12 watts per meter squared. This is considered to be the low end of the loudness that a healthy, full-grown, not-too-old human can pick up in terms of sound.
what this does is take these odd numbers, these ve this very strange range from 10 to the negative 12 to 1, and essentially reconverts it into a much more manageable scale. And so this scale, when we do the proportion of whatever the actual intensity is compared to the low end, and then scale it up by a logarithm, we essentially range it somewhere between, we could argue, 0 to 140 decibels, right? Which is a much more manageable range for us to describe loudness. So this is approximately, you know, 0 to 5 up to 140 decibels. And 140 decibels is when the intensity is 1, which would be the, the threshold of pain, the maximum hearing value that you can experience without necessarily damaging. And it's absolutely true. It's called the threshold of pain because if you hear a sound that is beyond 140 decibels or has an intensity that is 1 watt per meter squared or greater, the amount of energy that is entering your ears is actually damaging your ears. And you've heard this if you've ever heard of any soldier that had a grenade go off near them and their ears bled. Their ears really did bleed because they were damaged because of the sound pressure wave that went through their head. Right? It's extremely bad for you. And so this, can, this occurs in, most, in a lot of sudden very loud sounds like grenades, explosions, etc., but can also occur over prolonged exposure to things very close to the um, threshold of pain, such as loud, loud concerts or loud, uh, the example I think of is at the motorcycle shop. They put the motorcycles up on a dyno, which is basically a treadmill, and then they rev them as high as they can go to tune the engine to make it run as efficiently as possible. When that motor is turned all the way up, it's extremely loud. So experiencing that eight hours a day as someone, a mechanic that works on engines, they can go deaf in a month if they don't wear protective ear, hearing covers. Right? Does that make sense? All right, so that's intensity level. And really, this is a plug and chug uh, calculation where all you have to be able to do is solve for intensity. Right? And so obviously, you're going to have to do the inverse log and do some algebra to rearrange. So I'd like to show you an example of that. <clears throat> no, I, I have a few people that still need to take it, and then I will get back to you hopefully by Wednesday. Example. <clears throat> a jet 30 meters away. has sound from the engine at 140 decibels. What's the intensity? Oops, sorry. I'm trying to fix that. A jet 30 meters away has sound from the engine at 140 decibels, right? This is measured by some device that measures the intensity level, right? It's not measuring the intensity, it's measuring the intensity level <coughs> in decibels. Uh, the question is, sorry, this should say, what is the intensity level at 300 meters? Starting with beta equal to 10 log I over I naught. One hundred and forty decibels is what we're given, equal to ten log i over ten to the negative twelve. Dividing by ten, taking the inverse log, then multiplying by ten to the negative twelfth, i is a hundred watts per meter squared. You 
can work through that math on your own. It's really not that hard as long as you understand how to do the inverse log, which everybody does. Yes? Good. So as we did before, I is proportional to 1 over R squared. And so now we know what the intensity is at a particular location. right? And so you're going to do the calculation that we saw before, I over I compared to R squared over R squared. <clears throat> Since we are going from uh, 30 to 300, it's a pretty easy comparison, right? So that means that um, the new I is 1. This new intensity is at a new location, right? And so this is a new sound intensity or intensity level at this new location, a new loudness, because we are now 10 times as far away, right? So if we plug this back in to beta, 10 log 1 over 10 to the negative 12, and solve, we go down to 120 decibels. By moving from 30 meters away, which is the length of this room, to 300 meters away, which is nearly three and a half football fields away, the sound has only decreased by 20 decibels. This is because the relationship is exponential, right? And so it's important to recognize that 140, if you were standing next to that airplane, you would be bent over in pain because of how loud it is. 300 meters away, it's still extremely loud, but not vexingly, dear, you know, painfully uncomfortable, right? It takes a huge amount of distance in order for these things to decrease. Yes? So go back through your I1, I2 over I1 compared to R2 squared over R1 squared. Put your, two in, your intensity of 100 in at a distance of, oops, these are backwards, R1 and R2, yeah. And then put your, th your 30 and your 300 in there and rearrange and solve. Does that make sense? The point being, the intensity changes, right? depending on location, the intensity level also changes depending on location. So what is the only thing that is actually constant in all of this? Frequency. Good, that, and that wasn't what I was looking for, but that is correct. Frequency is, is constant, but what else? See, it's not in any of these calculations because we have to think about the source is the actual airplane, right? And so if we wanted to go all the way back to the thing that is held constant, then we're talking about the power being emitted by that thing, right? Which means that once you have the intensity, you have to work backwards through um, power over area to solve for the power. And what's neat is to think about the fact that the power at the 30 meters is the same as the power at 300 meters. Right? Because in one case, you're multiplying times 4 pi 30 squared, and in the other case, you're multiplying by 4 pi 300 squared. And so the number, the actual energy rate at which the sound is being emitted by the engine is a constant number. That would be the constant that you would have to work back to if you wanted to be able to predict what it would be at different locations without knowing what it is at any location. Right? I can't do this relationship if I don't have the intensity at one place. But if I know the intensity level, I can work backwards to figure out what the power is. And the power is a constant amount of energy being put out by the sound source. Once I know that, then I can 
determine the intensity and the, therefore the intensity level at any location in space. Power is what's constant.